Hello class, this is Dr. Branch. We're going to talk about abortion in the Bible. So first of all, there's no specific verse that says thou shalt not have an abortion. So the question is to discern what the Bible says about the moral status of preborn human life. The first thing we see is that humans are made in the image of God. Unlike animals, humans are made in the image of God. Notice how often we come back to this verse, Genesis 126. And so this is the definitive statement of Christian anthropology. When you compare what the Bible says here with what someone like Peter Singer says when he says, for example, a human infant with a defect is of less value than an animal or a dog, we really see the worldview implications. And so the abortion debate reflects the deeper debate about worldviews. If you believe humans are just the result of random time and chance, it's hard to argue against abortion at some level. But if you believe there's purpose and reason and made by God, then the pro-life position follows. The unique value of each human being, what do we do? What do we say about disabilities? Well, first of all, uh, we want to affirm that God is sovereign over disabilities. He told Moses uh, at the burning bush, who has made man's mouth or who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind, is it not I, the Lord? So God's sovereign over these things. And then Jesus healed the man born blind. This question was so much bad theology. Somebody sinned. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said it was neither that this man sinned or his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So disabilities give us an opportunity to learn about the grace of God and the power of God and that his glory might be displayed. Contrast that with the very naturalistic secular view of Richard Dawkins, former head of the Human Genome Project years ago. But he said about a Down syndrome baby, he said if it gets that diagnosis prenatally, abort it. Notice he won't call it a baby. He calls the baby an it to dehumanize it. Abort it, the Down syndrome baby, and try again. It would be immoral to bring it into the world if you had the choice. So this is something he said in a tweet. Well, the fact is some of the most blessed opportunities for interaction in life I've had have been with uh, kids who had Down syndrome. So Richard Dawkins is... Uh, really showing a heartless attitude here. The person conceived and the person born are one and the same. You see this in Genesis 4, 1. So Eve gave a conceived Cain and she gave birth to Cain. So it's the person conceived or, or one and the same. You see the same thing in Job 3, let the day perish. He's very sad here, of course, which it was when I was born in the night, which said a boy is conceived. So that was him that was conceived. That was him that was born. There's a continuity between the person conceived and the person born. Well, there is a fundamental continuity between prenatal and postnatal life. This is a, one of my favorite statements. Psalm 51.5, notice that David says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So this uh, uh, essential attribute of every human, a sinful nature, was present from the time he was conceived. So that was him that was conceived. It was him that was born. A continuity. We see this most clearly in Psalm 139. I'm sure many of you know this passage in context, affirming both God's omnipotence and his omnipresence and his omniscience. And it says, you can't run from me in the womb, is what God is saying. And David says, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Inmost being, that's the word kilyat, means kidneys or the, uh, the, the organs. And then knit me together, God's described as a master weaver at work making something beautiful, which leads to the next verse. By the way, there's a baby at 16 weeks. Just to understand we're not talking about some blob of jello or flesh. It's a human. So life in the womb evokes wonder at God's power to create. It says, I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The Hebrew can be uh, paraphrased as I am awesomely wonderful. And so it's not in some sort of self-help guru sort of way, but in the sense of God's power and might to create and make wonderful things. And God is even present in the womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Remember, the psalm is all about God's omnipresence. The most secret place in that culture a thousand years before the time of Christ was in the womb. David said, I can't run from you there. Also, the word frame refers to his bones. In verse 13, God makes the organs. Verse 15, God makes the bones. And the depths of the earth, the phrase is merely a metaphor for deepest concealment. It's a poetic device. You know, David knows babies don't come from a cave in the earth. But he's saying that even in the most obscure place from which I can imagine, which is the womb, 
that God is still present there. So God has a plan for every unborn child. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So the word for unformed body is golem. It's the Hebrew word for fetus. It only occurs here in the Old Testament, a hapax legomena. But notice that God has a, uh, even your eyes saw my unformed body. Even at that point, God had a plan for him. Next uh, slide. There's a continuity between prenatal and postnatal life. Me, me, and my, these repeated pronouns over and over again. So there's a fundamental continuity between prenatal and postnatal life. Taken as a whole, Psalm 139 underscores God's activity in forming the entire preborn child, including the organs and skeletal frame. There's a fundamental continuity between prenatal and postnatal life. To put an exclamation point on it, we go to Jeremiah 1 5, which says, I, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. So God didn't, it's not that Jeremiah pre existed, but that God knew him and his omniscience. Part of that is his foreknowledge. But the point is, God formed Jeremiah in the womb. That was before I, he formed you. That was Jeremiah, it wasn't someone else. Fundamental continuity. Innocent human life is categorically granted protection. The, the Sixth Commandment says, Thou shalt not murder. The word for murder is ratzah. It's a more precise reading than the much too general kill. So there is some allowance from my perspective for taking of human life in the cases of capital punishment, just war, and self-defense. But... Uh, I realize the word murder is strong, but it is, in fact, the right word if this is a human life. We are not arguing for the execution, the capital execution of women who abort. There's uh, my notes I encourage you to look at concerning uh, common arguments made by pro-choice people. But what I would say quickly is there's lots of forces pushing them, and many times they are manipulated into uh, the act of abortion. So infanticide is categorically condemned. Uh, the Pharaoh told the Hebrew wives to kill the babies. They didn't, and they were praised by God for it. Leviticus 18, you have the attempt to, or the prohibition of offering children to Molech. So some people get upset when you bring up this case of pagan sacrifice, but both pagan child sacrifice and modern abortion have to do with the intentional killing of children and in both cases, the goal is that something good will happen. If you sacrifice your child to Molech, your crops will be better, your herds more productive. And in a similar way, if someone aborts a baby, then the idea in, in many cases in our culture is they're going to be financially better off. The incarnation leads to the sanctity of preborn human life. The uh, in Jesus Christ, God became man, the Word became flesh. Notice this, when Joseph is going to divorce Mary, the angel comes to him and says, No, what's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. You're going to call his name Jesus. He's already the Messiah at conception, which means if he's already Messiah, he already has personhood. And this strikes at the developmental view of personhood related to most pro-abortion arguments. So when did the incarnation begin? I would stress to you that if you have an answer that's anything other than the conception, then you have a heresy called adoptionism. This is an ancient heresy that claimed Jesus became the Messiah when he was born, or maybe when he's in the temple at age 12, or maybe when he's baptized, or maybe when he's uh, being tempted in the Garden of Gethsemane even. All these are wrong. Jesus was the Messiah at conception. And so the angel said to her, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, you shall name his shall name him Jesus. He's the Messiah already at conception. So the text makes clear that the child in Mary's womb was already the Messiah at conception. If Jesus was fully human and the Messiah at conception, the conclusion follows that the rest of humanity is fully human as well. The term brephos, I want to underscore this Greek word, and it's used in reference to John the Baptist in the womb and Jesus in the manger. So here in this passage, Mary comes to visit Elizabeth, and John the Baptist, the brephos, leaps in her womb. So here the word brephos is used for John the Baptist in the womb. And then also, it's used for Jesus in the manger in Luke chapter 2, and they came and found the baby, the brephos, in the manger. The point being the same term applies to a preborn baby and a newborn baby. 
they're both the same. They both have the same moral standing. It's just a baby. I would also point out to you that when Mary comes to visit Elizabeth, she's only at two weeks of prenatal development, and at that point even Mary calls her the mother of my Lord, again reinforcing the complete personhood. And if Jesus had personhood at conception, then other humans do as well. So I'm going to skip past this part and just promise you and remind you that God forgives the sin of abortion. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. John 1 18. And John first John excuse me, Isaiah 1 18. Then 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Jesus Christ forgives sins, even the sin of abortion, men who've uh, aborted a child or women who've aborted a child. So let me scoot past these and point out two other things to you from early church history. So even though the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not have an abortion, there's a couple of early church references that are quite striking. The letter to Dionysius, somewhere between 100 and 150 A.D., says, Christians marry like the rest of men and beget children, but they do not abandon their babies that are born. So no infanticide. And then the Didache, again, a second century document, maybe 150, I don't know the date for the Didache, but it's early. And it says this, one aspect of the way of life for Christians is that Christians do not kill an unborn child or murder an infant. So when we stand for the sanctity of life and we stand against abortion, we are advocating a position the church has been saying for 2,000 years. We're not saying something new. And it had really our position is to a degree separate from current political debates. And so we're thrilled if any party gets on our side. But don't let someone try to tell you abortion is a political issue. Abortion is a moral, theological, ethical issue deeply grounded in the sanctity of human life from conception to natural death in the Bible. 